Hi, I'm Caitlin. Hi, I'm Rebecca. We're not from Memphis, but we love it. Welcome to Memphis Type History, the podcast. Good morning, Caitlin. Good evening, Rebecca. It's been a while since we've recorded an episode. It has. We're just saying we hope we remember how to do this, more or less. (laughs) Yes. I think we're always kind of hoping we remember how to do it, even if we did it the day before. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Caitlin, this episode that we're recording today, I know you think it's going to be about TGI Fridays. Yeah, I do think that. Wait. (laughs) I know. I know you're thinking it's going to be about TGI Fridays. And if people are listening to this right now, they're probably like, what's TGI Fridays? Because it's not even called that anymore. And what does it have anything to do with Memphis, right? Right. But so it's equally as random as what we're going to learn about today. Okay. (laughs) Okay. So everyone's just going to have to wait another time to learn what TGI Fridays is? Yeah. Okay. All right. That'll come in the future. That's a good teaser. (laughs) <laughs> All right. I have no idea what is happening right now. <laughs> I know. And I'm, I'm figuring out how, to, how should I start this? And I think the best way to start this is I'm going to read a comment that was posted on our fa- Facebook page. Okay. From a guy named Mark Johnson. He posted this on October 15, 2017. And actually, let me, let me just state that. Let me just stop right there. Because as you know, people like have been submitting stuff to us, ideas, comments and I want everyone to know that they don't go unnoticed so (laughs) that's why I'm bringing this up because this was from October of last year and there are people that have sent comments even further ago than that and we'll get to it as best as we can there's just two of us so we and we have full-time jobs and new children and (laughs) yeah (laughs) all the sort so if we haven't answered it's not because we don't like your idea it's just that we probably haven't gotten to it or we are in the midst of researching it. Yeah. So there you have it. So from Mark Johnson on October 15, 2017, he posted on our Facebook page, okay, it's time for your Memphis earthquake stories. This morning's 3.6 in Arkansas shook our 97-year-old house in Memphis for about eight seconds. Felt just like the one we had in the 70s when I was a kid. And I watched the needle bounce all over the album I had playing on the Magnavox. Okay, so I didn't respond to his comment because little does Mark Johnson know, and I hope he's listening to this, little did he know that I was going through a really rough paranoia patch about earthquakes at the time. Whoa, okay. (laughs) Yes. When we first moved to Memphis and we had to get our insurance, it was like car insurance, you know, we went to State Farm, and there was a brochure on the desk that said, do you know about or an earthquake the could big happen at any moment? Yeah, it was yeah. like something pretty devastating sounding, traumatic sounding. And that was the first that I heard of this, but I kind of tucked it under the rug. And then for whatever reason, last year, <laughs> like last fall, I think probably because of there was a lot of um, natural disasters that happened. And then there was a big earthquake in Mexico and And so finally, I've come to researching this fault line. Wow. Okay. And I feel so much better about it. Okay. I want to hear it. Okay. So I'm going to start off with the history of earthquakes that have happened in Memphis or with this fault line. So for everybody who doesn't know, there is a very important fault line that runs really close to Memphis. It's called the New Madrid Seismic Zone, or as a lot of people will say, the New Madrid Fault Line. And this is, uh, what is that? Well, it's a 150 mile long seismic zone, which extends into five states. It stretches southward from Cairo, Illinois, through, I'm going to say Haiti, it's H-A-Y-T-I, Carothersville, and New Madrid in Missouri. New Madrid, that's where it comes from. Through Blytheville into Mark Tree in Arkansas. It also covers a part of West Tennessee near Real Foot Lake, extending southeast into Dyersburg. So I hope people know those cities, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced any, which I'm sure I did. Send us your comments. They won't go unnoticed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let me tell you about the uh, first known written record of an earthquake felt in the New Madrid seismic zone. Cool. It was from a French missionary traveling up the Mississippi with a party of explorers. And at 1 p.m. on Christmas Day is when it happened. It was 1699, a site near present-day location of Memphis. How did it know? How did it know that it was on Christmas Day? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Just seems very, like, auspicious for the French missionary to feel the earthquake on Christmas Day. On Christmas Day. He's like, Jesus? The party was startled, his little group. 
obviously. It was uh, by a short period of ground shaking. So that's the first recorded earthquake. But the most famous, and which is the one that gets everybody scared, is a series of three earthquakes between 1811 through 1812. There's two on December 16, 1811, one on January 23rd, 1812, and one on February 7, 1812. The first one was recorded at 2.15 a.m. in northeast Arkansas. It caused only slight damage to man-made structures, and that's mostly because it wasn't greatly populated at the time. Uh, it is 1800s. The future location of Memphis, Tennessee, was shaken at a Mercalli intensity scale of level 9. Do I sound like a professor? It's like, <laughs> yeah, sure. Like a scientist. They usually don't ask, do I sound like a professor? But other than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm working. I'm, re- I'm working really hard here. It's, you sound very professional about earthquakes. Thank you. If that's what you're asking. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, Little Prairie, Missouri was destroyed by soil liquefaction. Liquefaction? Soil liquefaction. I'm going to say that's how you pronounce it. What? What does that mean? I'm glad you asked. It's basically where the soil looks like it's liquid and it just kind of, I'm using hand motion here, so I know it doesn't help, but. Well, it helps me. Yeah, just like things sink into it <laughs> and. Oh, it's like becomes quicksand. Can you get out of it? Uh, Maybe not. That's weird. So just the the vibration of the shaking does that? And the shifting. So it's like wow. soil just like gets sucked in the ground and it, liquid's coming up and just. That's crazy. Yes. So Little Prairie was destroyed. Uh, At the fault line, uh, trees were knocked down and riverbanks collapsed. Uplifts of the ground on the riverbed and large waves made the Mississippi River look like it was flowing upstream. Isn't that crazy? Oh, I've heard about this. Yes. Yeah. So people really thought that the river was flowing backward, which I thought was interesting. I've I've even seen the river. It turned the river backwards. Like that was a fact, but it was it was just an illusion. Yeah. Illusion. Isn't that crazy? Sandbars and points of islands gave way. Whole islands disappeared. There was a steamboat crew that was anchored overnight along the Mississippi, or they were anchored on a Mississippi island, and they said they awoke to find the island had disappeared below the water. Whoa. Yeah. Landslides covered an area of 78,000 to 129,000 square kilometers. That was extending from Cairo, Illinois to Memphis, Tennessee, and from Crowley's Ridge in northeastern Arkansas to Chickasaw Bluffs, Tennessee. I'm just naming these cities just in case people are like, hey, that's my place. This event shook windows and furniture in Washington, D.C., rang bells in Richmond, Virginia, shook houses in Charleston, South Carolina, and knocked plaster off of houses in Columbia, South Carolina. Whoa. Yeah. That's crazy. It is. (laughs) Observers in Herculaneum, Missouri, said it had a duration of 10 to 12 minutes, which I'm sure felt like a long time. For those who like numbers... This is for those who like numbers. The area that caused an alarm to the general population from the shaking was 2.5 million square kilometers. And after all of this, only one life was lost in falling buildings. Wow. Yeah. It helps to not be very populated. That and probably like not a lot of skyscrapers and things like that at the time. Like no big office buildings and... Yeah. Well, so as I'm researching all this, I'm just like, oh, man, Memphis is not doing so good. (laughs) Oh, goodness. Oh, yeah, I was, I was getting more nervous again as I was doing this. But there's hope. That's why I'm able to do this. Okay. That was the first earthquake. Then the first and largest aftershock happened that same morning, and that was around 7.15 a.m. And that came to be known as the dawn aftershock. But that's not as important as the second earthquake. Uh, the second earthquake on January 23rd is believed to be the smallest of the three main shocks. And it's also believed by some that the epicenter was in southern Illinois. And interestingly... That raises concern, because if that is true, then that would mean the extended section of the fault exists. So it means that it's bigger than they have been able to recognize. Oh, interesting. We're going to say that it's not true. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, sure. Then the third. The third earthquake was on February 7. That happened in Missouri, and it was the largest of the series. It destroyed the town of New Madrid. It damaged many houses in St. Louis. It caused general ground warping, ejections, fissuring, severe landslides, and caving of stream banks. And last thing that I found was uplift along the fault created temporary waterfalls on the Mississippi River and caused the formation of Real Foot Lake. 
Waterfalls on the river. That's insane to me. I can't even imagine what that. Okay. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And then how long does it take to, it goes up and creates a waterfall. How long for it to sink back down? I don't even think I can visually understand this. No, I mean, that's, in, that's crazy. I want to, man. Okay. The New Madrid fault line is best known for some of the most violent earthquakes to ever hit the U.S. I think we established that. But I just wanted to make sure to, to quote that, that these are recorded to be some of the most. And I wanted to give some additional history fun facts about this fault line. One of them is there's a New Madrid Historical Museum in the Missouri Boot Heel. Oh, and apparently they uh, loop a VHS tape there, and it's called The Night the Earth Went Crazy. In 1990, there was an earthquake hype. A prophecy had just been made by a self-proclaimed climatologist named Ivan Browning, who falsely claimed to have predicted the, eight, the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake in California the year before. Uh, which, by the way, this earthquake is pretty interesting on its own. It was the earthquake that people say the World Series helped save lives for, because the World Series was going on when this earthquake happened in California, and people say that it helped people not be on the roads because they were watching the World Series. But then there are also people trying to get home in time to watch it too. So that was also a problem. Anyway, the world and that World Series didn't happen. A mixed bag. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I know. But there were a lot of people in that stadium and they were safe. But they didn't get to finish watching the World Series because they had to cancel it. Yeah, because the ground is shaking, I guess, that interferes with the game. Bridges fell or highways broke. Yeah. You know, the stuff that happens with earthquakes. But anyway, uh, Ivan Browning was predicting that a magnitude 7 earthquake would strike New Madrid on December 3rd, 1990. And the prediction had no scientific legitimacy, but it was widely reported in the national media. Well, he is self-proclaimed, so. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But if there's a hype, people are going to fall for it. I think um, in my earlier days, I would have totally fallen for it. Um, Anyway, it caused some fear, anxiety, some hysteria uh, among residents of the Mississippi Valley. All that stress for nothing. Is this why people say like, "Well, we're due for the big one"? And it, is that yes. actually true, or is this, or is the '90s why people say that? No, there people do believe that I believed it last year. Well, I know when people say, "Oh, we're due for," like I believe, "Oh, we're due for a big one." Like every X number of years, this is supposed to happen. And we're like overdue, but is that true, or is that because of the hype from before? And so people just say, "Oh, we're due, overdue, we're overdue for the big one." No, as much as this fault line is a mystery, more scientists than not believe that to be true, based on whatever research they're doing, like real ones. Mm-hmm. Okay, like they really believe it's a ticking <laughs> right. time bomb. Okay, just checking. Yeah, so that won't keep repeating it if it was just from this self-proclaimed climatologist, Ivan. Yeah. Guy. No, you should just keep saying, <laughs> "I think it's the big one." It's going to happen. You should be the next Ivan Browning. Is that what his name was? I should. <laughs> I missed my calling. Caitlin, the next Ivan Browning. Going to talk about the big one. Okay, so as I was researching this, I found um, some hope for us citizens of Memphis. All right. It might seem like a bit of a stretch, but but here it goes. The city recently spent $25 million to prevent the pyramid from being swallowed. So if you're shopping at Bass Pro and an earthquake happens, you should just stay there, okay? Or if you're by the pyramid, run as fast as you can <laughs> inside the pyramid and uh, take some cover. That's funny to me because of all places <laughs> to make sure it doesn't sink, yes. they're going with the pyramid, which I know like <laughs> now sentiment about the pyramid, I guess, has turned because... <laughs> People like Bass Pro Shop and all that. But like, yeah. that's the thing that we're not going to let sink <laughs> of all of Memphis. It's going to well, be the pyramid. <laughs> yeah, I thought about that because I thought it's on the river. Like, why invest in something that's ultimately on the river anyway? But I think the reasoning is new, all new development is keeping the earthquake in mind. Like, if I were to move downtown, I would feel better about moving into one of the newest developments because their standards are up to code for an earthquake. Unfortunately, I work in a really old building on South Main, so I am probably going to be doomed. But there's hope, as the theme is right now. Uh, The next bit of hope for us is AutoZone's corporate headquarters also stands ready for some massive shakes. Some massive shakes. So if you work at AutoZone, you should feel good about that. You know, if, if if the ground starts shaking, just duck and cover. You're, you might 
you're probably okay. Uh, it's propped on top of giant shock absorbers. And then there's another place. Would you like to take a random guess? Place downtown has a lot of uh, patients. Oh, the hospital. A hospital, yeah. I was thinking patients like good at waiting. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Patients, do you have to have patients? I was like, what place has (laughs) patients? The nearby Memphis VA. Ah. It's another safe spot. The city spent $64 million removing nine floors of the hospital to reduce the risk of collapse in a catastrophic earthquake. Okay. So if you're a patient in the... VA, have patience, you'll be just fine. Okay? Yeah. (laughs) Nice. That's a late night joke. Yeah. (laughs) Here's another bit of hope. There is a seismologist and professor at Northwestern named Seth Stein, and he doesn't think we should be worried about the New Madrid at all. He says, in California, there's plenty of strain where the Pacific plate grinds. Against the edge of North America, earthquakes are easy to understand. So he says as the plates try to move past each other, they catch and strain builds up. And when the strain reaches a breaking point, the land snaps back into place. And those, my friends, are called earthquakes. So it's basically the strain that's happening. And to give an idea of movement that he's measured to cause strain, or I don't know if that makes sense. He says along the San Andreas or St. Andreas, the ground is warping at a rate of 40 millimeters per year. The longer California goes without earthquakes, the more strain this motion builds up. And then as a result, Los Angeles is long overdue for a truly massive earthquake because of that strain that's building up. So you actually want a lot of small ones, I guess. Yes, that's that's the thing. Yeah. So the less strain that builds up, the less likely you're going to have a massive earthquake. And Chile or Chile. Home to the largest earthquakes in recorded history, the Nazca Plate is diving under South America at 80 millimeters per year, uh, which is twice that of California. So they even have it worse than California does. But when Stein put his GPS receivers all over the New Madrid seismic zone, he found that the ground was hardly moving at all, less than two millimeters per year and possibly zero. So to that theory, it sounds like nothing's really going to happen. If it's about strain. Okay. But people argue against that. There must be other theories. Though, yeah. Of course. Okay. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. as soon as you said, he said, ah, earthquakes are easy to explain. I'm like, uh, surely there's art. Ar- like there must be, <laughs> if they're so easy, they must not be that easy. Yeah. <laughs> Just depending on what's, anyway, there's always like back and forth about that kind of stuff. I would like think. more people would have, would come to that conclusion, right? Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. But I like his theory. I'm going with that one. I know. It gave me a lot of hope. That and the Bass Pro. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks, Seth, for giving us that. Uh, unfortunately, there are skeptics of his theory. Anyway, every year there are hundreds of small earthquakes in the New Madrid seismic zone. <laughs> and the USGS points to this ongoing seismicity as a cause for concern. Even raising the threat level for 2016 after an uptick in rumbling. But Stein contends these are still aftershocks from the 1811 and 1812 events. So people that are concerned about these little shakes, he says, oh, no, no, they're just little aftershocks from the big event. I want to dive into that, but you're not the person to ask questions (laughs) of that. I have so many questions about that, but okay. Yeah. I need an earthquake person to to answer my questions there. (laughs) Mostly, how is that possible? It's like stars. You see one and it could have burned out like millions of years ago, but we still see the light. Even though the star is gone, that blows my mind. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know about that. We should just get some scientists on. We can ask some questions about earthquakes in space. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to get back to uh, why there possibly isn't any hope. There's somebody na- by the name of, he, it's a, he's a geologist named Charles Langston. He's at the Center for Earthquake Research and Information at the University of Memphis. And he doesn't seem to believe in Stein's theories. Uh, he says it's just one scenario that nothing will happen, but it's a low probability scenario. There's plenty of evidence that the New Madrid seismic zone in particular is still hazardous. So as for Langston, he's been listening to the New Madrid seismic zone for the past few years, and what he's heard has been disquieting. That's the word that was used for describing what he has heard. After setting up 81 seismometers in eight states, Langston's team has been using the sound of large earthquakes from the other side of the planet to map out the earthquake hazard directly below his feet. They found that the sound waves from these distant calamities markedly slowed down as they passed through New Madrid seismic zone compared to the earth around it. 
So just the fact that they can hear something different from the zone to the earth around it uh, causes some alarm. There's a quote from him that says, to explain those areas of low seismic velocity, you have to say that the rocks are different in some way. And in fact, they almost have to be molten, he said. But since there's no volcanoes, they're probably not molten. They're probably hot. You also probably, your face, <laughs> you're so confused. <laughs> well, my question was why, and I was like, I'm not even going to bother. Like, I don't understand the sound thing. And I was it's too scientific. But now I'm even more confused. Yes. But uh, He said... They're molten, but not molten, so they're hot, but not molten. I don't know. <laughs> anyway. I'm just quoting this guy. <laughs> and for all the scientists out there, this is for all you. Right. And then he goes on to say, you also probably need water at great depth. So there's some very unusual things going on. So what that all says is that that part of the mantle and the crust is unusually weak compared to the adjacent parts. So it makes sense that the New Madrid seismic zone is there. It's a weak spot in the crust that makes earthquakes. So he's saying it's going to make earthquakes no matter what. Okay. I don't like how he explained that, so I'm not not going to go with that that one one so much. The other thing was much simpler. Made a lot of logical sense to me. This one has a lot of probabilities. Yeah. I also want to read this other quote from (laughs) a a site, which I'm going to make sure to link all these sites on our show notes, which will be memphistyphistory.com slash earthquake. I'm going to list this quote because I feel like it may have been a typo. And I'm going to say it because I'm confused and I'm hoping somebody that knows earthquakes can tell me if how this makes sense. And it said, the zone is a series of faults and secondary fractures that extend from marked tree, Arkansas, into southern Illinois. One of the elements that makes the system unique is that unlike most fault lines, it has a beginning in and end. Does that make sense to you? I think it just means a beginning and an end. It has to be a typo, right? It's not like some scientific yeah beginning and an end so is it unusual for fault lines to have an, a beginning and an end is it usually because they come from like california an edge girl i have no idea everything i know about earthquakes i just learned <laughs> okay. from you i'm asking you the questions <laughs> now <laughs> that fact alone has a team of more than 50 scientists from across the globe stationed in memphis and wow. gary patterson leads the team that's studying the dangerous situation. He says, we're an enigma. It's a puzzle. And many scientists have dedicated their whole careers trying to figure this out. And I will definitely agree with that. Is After all this research, I feel like what it comes down to is that this fault line is just a mystery. So their question is, when will the big one hit? Yeah, that's the question everybody's asking, except for um, Seth Stein. <laughs> To him, it's real simple. (laughs) Yeah, he's like, there's no big one coming, guys. Yeah. I I hope he's listening to this and saying that. It's not coming, guys. They're probably all listening, shaking their heads. (laughs) (laughs) But here's my biggest hope. You remember I told you I had bigger hope? Well, here it comes. Gary Patterson helped Fox 13. That's where one of the sites or, or one of my sources comes from. He helped them crunch the numbers. And best estimates indicate that over the next 50 years, the probability of a magnitude 6 or larger quake is between 25 to 40 percent. And short, if you are 35 years old or younger, there's a good chance you will experience an earthquake in the Mid-South that measures higher than a 6. And I'm 36. Wait, I'm 37. (laughs) I can't, I honestly can't remember if I turned 36 or 37. Well, you're above 35. That's all that matters, right? That's all that matters is I'm above 35. I'm at least 36. Uh, well, good for you. You will not experience it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, all I got to do is that's funny. before I die or I don't know, I just got to tell my children to go live further out east or somewhere else. I probably won't live to see it. Or get a real sturdy piece of furniture and live get wherever you want. Get a piece of furniture, shop at Bass Pro a bunch. Work at AutoZone. Yep. We're good. Or just live in a newer building because that's what people are doing. Maybe you could also just be on a boat because those guys on that boat woke up and the island they were anchored to was gone. (laughs) So they must not have noticed anything. (laughs) And the whole island sunk. I know. They were asleep. (laughs) They were sleeping like babies. They like (laughs) woke up and the island was gone. What has happened in the night? (laughs) They're like, wasn't there an (laughs) island right here? What happened last night? <laughs> oh, that's funny, man. Yeah, just like, be in a houseboat, maybe. A houseboat, yeah. You know, it's not a bad idea. Although it may feel like you're f- 
floating backward on the Mississippi. Yeah, but that's all right. That's kind of cool. So that's the New Madrid seismic zone for you. Show notes are memphistypehistory.com slash earthquake. Thanks to Mark Johnson for sparking this conversation. And we hope to get a lot more of these uh, questions answered for people or recommendations. Yeah. Well, this has been a very successful event then. Yeah. If anyone has any anxieties over anything in Memphis, just uh, let us know about it and we'll ease your, your fears. Yeah. For everyone who's over 35, I hope you feel really good right now. Well, you've been listening to Memphis Type History, the podcast. We like your type. You've been listening to Memphis Type History, the podcast. It would mean so much to us if you head over to iTunes and give us a rating and review. Be sure to subscribe and never miss an episode. Want to be part of Memphis Type History and get behind the scenes content, merch, and more? Support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Memphis Type History. That's Patreon spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Memphis Type History. Find more Memphis Type History on our blog at memphistypehistory.com, on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest as Memphis Type History, and on Twitter at Memphis Type. 